Right, so we'll start off by you stating your name. All right, uh, this is uh, Dan Conahan, and today is um, July the 7th, 2011, and I'm being interviewed for two very nice ladies <laughs> from Notre Dame, and they're doing a project in relation, in conjunction with uh, Dr. Rotman's archaeological digs on Irish history. Okay, thank you. Um, so my first question is, when did your family first come to the island? Mm -hmm. In my genealogy, there are three families on my father's side. <coughs> Daniel and Catherine Boyle is my great-great-grandparents, and they arrived here on the island. They were married in Toronto, which was then called Fort York, in 1857. And they arrived here either in 1857 or 1858. And their first child was born in 1861 here on Beaver Island. Then one of their daughters married an Anthony Malloy. Now, that is another great great grandparent, Anthony Malloy, and his wife also came to the island between the period of 1858 and 1859, thereabouts. They lived in New York City. Oh, okay. And they had immigrated from Aaron Moore, as the Boyles did, somehow between the early 1850s, after the Great Famine of 1846 to 49. Now, they stayed in New York City and had two children in New York City and then arrived here as I say, about 1859 or so, and then proceeded to have other children in their family, of which one of those men married the Boyle, Bridget Boyle, and they produced <coughs> my grandmother. The third part of the family genealogy was my great-grandfather, Hugh Conahan, a young bachelor of about 20 or 21, who also came during that same time period with the Boyles. And he was, uh, and that would have been 1857 to 1858, somewhere in there. And he was a bachelor, and he later started a store and owned a store um, on Sand Bay, uh, just um, above, um, uh, I forget the road now, but below CMU, where CMU is, somewhere along oh. that, that Sand Bay area. And it, was a, it was a store because it catered to people that were living on that side of the island without having them to come up here. So the three families were here within two years of the Mormons leaving. And the Mormons left in 1856. And as the decades moved on, more and more families came from Aaron Moore and um, that west coast of Ireland, particularly Donegal, and kept coming and moving. And usually they knew someone by relation who then told them about the island and then they kept coming. And that's how it proceeded all through the, the latter part of the 19th century. So those are my three families. So we go back on my father's side that far. Uh, so. um, do you know anything about like any of the bigger changes um, from like living on Aramore and then moving over here to Beaver Island. Did, do you know anything about like the adjustments they had to make and like social structure or The very how interesting they lived? thing about them coming directly from Aaron Moore to here and I think this is a point that Dr. Rodman would, would agree with in terms of Irish communities. There was no integration in American life. They went directly by boat and of course they were paid to leave Ireland by the landowners. And the two routes were through New York City and then up the Great Lakes to Beaver Island. Some landed in the coal fields of Pennsylvania and then later moved to the island. Some stayed in New York City for a year or two or three and then came on. The other route was through Canada, which was then Fort York, which is now Toronto. They wouldn't have stayed there very long, but some of them might have just stayed and then continued to live in Canada. But the most part, they came directly from Aaron Moore to the island. So there was no integration in American 
society. The other thing that's very important <coughs> is that they all spoke Gaelic. There was no chance for them to learn English until after they got here and decades later through the integration of the island with some of the uh, traders and French uh, speaking people who knew English. And then gradually, there were speak pe the old people were still speaking Gaelic well into the 1920s. Some of the older women and men from that generation were still speaking Gaelic. Certainly when they first arrived, they were all speaking Gaelic. So there was no integration of sitting in a city like Boston or New York or Philadelphia uh, or later Chicago and then being integrated into the, um, the English speaking community. So I think that's the major, major thing to remember about this transfer directly from Ireland to the island. So. Great. Okay. Um, and then do you know anything about like um, what life was like here on the island for your grandparents at all? Or yes, talk a little uh, bit about that? Um, my grandparents, uh, Catherine Malloy, uh, who married Hugh Conahan, my grandfather, she was born in 1891 and he was born in 1882. Most Irish men were older by anywhere from six to ten years than the woman. And my grandmother at the time was 18. <coughs> and so they married, and <coughs> my grandfather was a fisherman. And he started out that way. And he was born down on Sand Bay as, my, as his father, my great-grandfather, Hugh Cunningham, had the store. My grandmother's parents had the first meat market here on Beaver Island, which the building, the original building burned but this, the second original building is still standing and it's now that little gift shop um, right on the, right up from the post office. Oh, there. okay. And he, um, he also had a hotel in Escanaba and then they came back here in the 1890s and then he started the meat market. And then he uh, kind of retired in the 1910s, 1915s uh, or so and one of his sons um, Lawrence Malloy took over the meat market, and that was my grandmother's brother. So you had certain trades that were going on, but primarily fishing, which was uh, in, in this area was probably one of the greatest fishing areas in the world, <coughs> all through the uh, mid 19th into the 20th century. Then in 1902, you had the lumber, uh, you, you always had lumber various cuttings and so on and so forth. But then it was organized by a company that came up from um, uh, around Free Soil, Michigan, just above Muskegon. And they set up shop here, built docks and a lumber mill, and then they established a tr railroad track on the west side where they were able to have uh, camps. And then they uh, culled and, and, and treed and chopped a lot of the lumber all the way down to the west side of the island. And then that lasted till about 1914, 1915. And then that kind of dissipated because they had taken as much as they could. And then the fishing continued. Um, but the lumber continued on too. Was my grandfather worked in the lumber mill well into the 1940s. And he gave up fishing because it was difficult. Oh, okay. But fishing was uh, a primary source of income and work for a multitude of the families. But those, that's in terms of my grandparents. Um, the Boyles were farmers. They continued to, f to farm. They had a farm out on um, Darkie Town Road, which we now call Barney's Lake Road. And they had about 100 and, oh, I don't know, 20, 30 acres or so. And But they also fished. Okay. So, and they had enough boys. They had um, nine children, six boys and three girls. So there was enough to help, mm -hmm. and um, the fishing would be in one seasonal situation, and then simultaneously you do farming so that you had a cash crop, which was fishing, and sustenance was the farming. Okay, okay. okay. And cows, and you had a few cows and chickens and so on, so you were able to sustain yourself quite well, you know, that way. 
and my great 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 grandfather Daniel Burrell, he 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 in fact he went back to Ireland a number of times, which meant that he had some cash right. to uh, get on a boat and come back and so on. And he owned a boat um, called the Marianne, and um, he died in 1919. And then my um, my grandmother's father he died in 1929. And um, Hugh Conahan. My great grandfather died in 1894. He was pretty young. He was only 64 when he died. The rest were well into their 80s when they passed away. Yeah. All right. And then, how about your parents? What did they do here? Well, my father was born in 1911 above the meat market. Okay. He was the second of 14 children. The first was a girl by the name of Marie. She was born about a year and a half earlier. And then uh, he grew up on the island and uh, moved to Chicago in 1929 at the age of 18 to find work. Now, 1929 starts the era of the Depression. Roughly 1929 through and including World War II. So he moved to Chicago and uh, met my mother, who was Chicago-born, and she's a, she was of Polish ancestry, born in Chicago. And her parents had come from what was then um, Prussia. Um, we don't know when they arrived, but mother was born in 1909 in Chicago. Oh, okay. okay. So they married in the 30s, and um, worked in Chicago and had jobs all through the Depression. You could find work, particularly if you were, if you knew how to operate a boat. Dad was very good on the water and spent his, the rest of his life on the water. And you could always find jobs. There was fishing out of Chicago, of course, and there were other boat situations. In fact, his first job was, uh, on a boat was uh, Mayor Big Bill Thompson's yacht. He got a job steering the boat or something, one, one doing something on the boat, steering or something, and um, it was owned by uh, then Mayor Big Bill Thompson, so, so that's so. Uh, oh, okay. And then after they married, they came up here during the war and after the war, and we lived here in the late 40s, from about 46 to 49, and my father attempted with one of his brothers to reestablish fishing. And we bought the the, um, the the old farm from the family, and I think his idea with his brother was to again do farming and fishing. But in the late 1940s, the fishing industry collapsed. By 1949, particularly the whitefish, the eel had come in through the Great uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, and had decimated the whitefish. And by 1949, the fishing industry in the upper Great Lakes here had collapsed, uh, primarily because of the white fish. So, Dad, um, we went to uh, Indiana and then uh, back to Chicago. And I grew up in Chicago. And then, uh, but we spent our summers here all through the f 1950s and into the mid-1960s when I finished college and then decided not to come up anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> now you're back. <laughs> but mother and dad then retired here in the 1970s, and my parents are buried here at the Holy Cross Cemetery. Okay. And um, they retired, and they, they didn't spend the winters, they would just spend the summer, six months summer and then six months either in Florida or nice. uh, <laughs> California, okay. which a lot of people did. Do you have any um, stories from your childhood here on Beaver Island from the summer? Well, what <laughs> kind of stories? Uh, what, would you <laughs> what would you do from Oh, daily okay, what would we do? <laughs> All right, well, we had a large group of cousins. <laughs> we had a large... <laughs> Friends! <laughs> Somebody's waving to us from the street. Um, we had a large group of cousins, age appropriate. And at some times we had 14, 15, 16, you know, boys, girls. 
And really, the summers were wonderful because we did nothing but, um, we had a few chores around the house, but it was swimming, it was hiking, it was picnics, marshmallow roasts, hot dog roasts. Um, and then when we got a little older, we did do some work. My uncle Archie Lafanier, who owned the Shamrock, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we would stay with him and his family, and he would put us to work. Of course, we didn't get paid, <laughs> but that was okay. That was, uh, that was to work on our room board <laughs> when we stayed with them. And, um, you know, when we were in high school, he had us um, haul beer from the boat and take it back to the Shamrock and then take the empties back to the boat and clean up and sweep floors and things like that. So, um, But it was very pleasant to be here in the summer. I mean, it, it, you know, it was just a very quiet kind of, of life. And uh, it centered around family. It centered around uh, your cousins and your friends. And um, you know, nothing extraordinary. And by the end of uh, the first part of August, we were heading back to Chicago to get ready for school. They left here around the first or second week of August to get back to school. So, okay. So I don't I don't remember any ins oh horseback riding was another favorite. Um, one of the the young fellows had a riding stable which is now the Stony Acre Grill. Oh okay. So over there you'd ride horses? Yes, or? we'd ride horses. And there were he had developed quite a number of trails that had been used by the lumber company, the Keebler Trail and other trails. So we were able to take the horses back in these trails, and we'd end up uh, on Donegal Bay, and then you'd come around the road there, and then come back into town, and so on. So that was that was a lot of fun. And then, of course, when you got to be 16, you had a car, mm -hmm. and then you started. Sometimes, you know, the parties were basically after 16. Um, Usually there was somebody that was able to get beer, <laughs> <laughs> and then, then there were, then we would go to these old houses that had been somewhat abandoned. Okay. Um, I won't say which ones. <laughs> um, and you know, just have a good time. Uh, there was always somebody that could sing or play a guitar. Um, they were particularly talented. Uh, I remember, and of course, then we, the Shamrock, we as kids would. That was our recreation. And then we had another place over on the other side of the harbor. Um, <coughs> the Wanties built a nice um, log for teenagers, and we had, you know, jukebox and dancing and pop and, you know, food and stuff like that. So it was, those were the things to do. So. It's a nice, mm -hmm. nice summer. Yeah, yeah. Uh. yeah. And the weather, was, the weather was just like we've been having you know, this these last couple of weeks. It could be cool around the 4th of July, but for the most part, you know, it would be in the 70s, in the low 80s. Plenty of time to spend the whole day at the beach, swimming, something like that, you know. And, um, and at night, put on a jacket and we'd have marshmallow roasts or picnic or something. And they had, the 4th of July wasn't that big then. We had August homecoming, which was a, a bigger thing. And in those days, you would have parades for the August homecoming. Uh, it's reversed itself now, and the August homecoming has kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. And um, the Fourth of July weekend is, is the big thing now. So, um, so would yeah, you so stay mostly in town when you're here, or? Well, we had the farm, which was about two miles outside of town, mm -hmm. and we stayed out there. We're by Shambay. Uh, no, we were right. on. Um, what is now called Barney's Lake Road. Oh, right. Lake Road. Barney's okay. Lake Road, yeah, on the way to Barney's Lake. It was um, rather primitive. We had an outhouse. <laughs> um, and, of course, we were there, and we had electricity, and we used to go to a neighbor, and we also had a pump in the field where you would go out and, and get water mm -hmm. for the, you know, for drinking and so on and so forth, and bring it back to the house, and that was part of the chores. And... Um, and then in terms of washing clothes, uh, we had a great big rain barrel and washing clothes in that. And we had, um, you know, we had the gas stove, propane gas stove. But the house had been an old, old house that had not been remodeled at all. In fact, the downstairs didn't have any electricity at all. Because when my great uncle lived there, you know, he didn't want any of those things. So it was a very simple uh, uh, house. 
and a great big yard and then across the fields we had the barn and just loads of acres of land and you know trails and blueberry picking mm -hmm. and strawberry picking you know, all summer and it was really very nice and then we had bicycles to come into town and we'd meet our cousins and other friends here and uh, you know go from there and then later when I was 16 dad bought me a car and that was primarily so we could get into town without any problem and go to the stores and things like that. So okay. Yeah. And then, um, do you know who built your farmhouse? Yes, my great-great-grandfather, Daniel Boyle, and his wife, Catherine, built the farmhouse. They had bought, they had been down on French Bay, living on French Bay. And in the 1880s, 1884, she was able to buy 40 acres of land on Barney's Lake Road there for back taxes for 10 cents. Mm -hmm. And then around 18, then they had a, a very simple cabin on the other, on one side of the road with a dirt floor, which was very common in those days, a log cabin, and then they started farming. <coughs> and he was also, as I say, later on fishing. Then about 18, 95, they built a very nice two-story log house on the other side of the road, which was uh, downstairs was the main uh, living room, which they would have used as a kitchen also, and then two bedrooms, and then upstairs were three more bedrooms. Oh, okay. So it was a very substantial log house, and in a certain part of the house now you can see the logs that are like 20 inches by 20 inches, and it was very typical of the day, and then chink was used to fill in the, the mid and then a roof. And then much later, in the 30s and 40s, they uh, covered it with um, siding. And then about 10 or 12 years later, they added a kitchen unit on with sheds and so on, which again was very common. You kind of added on. And in the summer, you had summer kitchens that were basically outdoors uh, type of thing. And because they had nine kids, and if they were farming, you would have had help. And so it was, it was a matter of you know, having um, a large enough place that you could cook for that many people and so on. And the house is still there. It's being used and owned by another person. And it's in very good shape. And it's good. Probably be there another 100 years. That's great. <laughs> yeah. so all the land, of course, has been grown over because of nobody farming. Uh, no one was farming, and the trees just go very quickly, especially <laughs> the pine and some of the other hardwoods just, you know, just take over. And in no time, cedar, there's a lot of cedar out there, and pine, and it just, it's all forest now. So, so oh. that's, uh, I can remember about that, you know. And a lot of, you know, going back to the 50s, there were still a lot of um, farms, but then farming gave out also because the older people weren't able to handle it. They simply, uh, a lot of their kids would have married and moved away. And um, there was a continuum of that all through the 50s. And a low point was, I think the population year-round in 1960 was about 165 or 170 wow. people. That was about, you know, that was, that was a pretty much low point. And I think even in 1970, it was still around 160 to 170 year round people. Um, so that was, but in the 50s, uh, there was still a lot of uh, nets and um, a lot of these sheds, um, the old dock, and of course the boats and so on, which are all. You can see a lot of the photographs and so on. There are still a lot of homes and structures that are still here today that were there, um, you know, many, many years ago. They've been used for different purposes somewhat, but the principal businesses, the Shamrock is still here, the Beachcomber is still here, McDonough's store is now a nice big modern Spartan mm -hmm. McDonough's yeah. store, <laughs> and that was, you know, much smaller. Uh, we didn't have a fire department. Um, I think we were protected by our guardian angels or something. Um, we never had fires. 
of any consequence up here. And uh, we had a small medical center, which is now a very beautifully large medical center. The school, of course, was here, grades 1 through uh, 12. The school is an interesting point to make about the history of the school. The school was publicly supported financially, but it was taught by ca Roman Catholic nuns all through the um, three quarters of the 20th century, all the way from about 1904 when they arrived to um, about 1976. That was at the main school. On other parts of the island, there were two other schools. One was Roosevelt School, which is right at the corner of Macaulay and Kings Highway. And another was Sunnyside, which is um, sort of right where Holy Cross Cemetery is now, on Kings Highway there. So that was a rather unique situation, given the rural uh, and the islandness of, of it. But it was publicly supported by the state, but the nuns were allowed to be the, the teachers. Okay. So. so would your grandparents have gone to, like, Roosevelt, or...? Uh, my father went to Roosevelt oh, okay. uh, down on um, Kings Highway and, and um, Macaulay Road because he was working and living with the besties down on, on Sand Bay there. He was working with um, uh, Lawrence McDonough, who is going to be 97. He and my father are cousins. Okay. And they were both... His dad was on the farm and helped the, the, the McDonough's, the bestie McDonough's which was common, because if you had too many kids in the house, they had to kind of move out and work so that the other kids could <laughs> grow up, <laughs> you know. I mean, there were 14 children mm -hmm. in his family. And my grandmother had 14 children, all by midwives, and she lived to be 92 years old. Wow. <laughs> so Amazing, that's great. Yeah, so... Um, but, um, yeah, he would have gone to Roosevelt School. I briefly, in the late 40s, remember going to Sunnyside. Yeah. Just for, it must have been in 49, just before we left, for a brief couple of months. You know, just I must have entered school for first grade or kindergarten or something, and then we, we left, left the island. But I do remember that. Do you remember uh, anything specific about how it was? Well, I remember, you know, it was a one-room schoolhouse, and I do remember that very well with the, the different little grades by rows. And we went to school, we were um, uh, friends of ours down the road uh, picked us up on a horse. Wow. That's how we got to school. Horseback. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> it wasn't very far from the farm on, on uh, Barney's Lake Road to, to, sun, to Sunnyside there. So Then they closed those schools. Uh, there weren't enough people up there. And they also moved the Catholic Church from where the cemetery is to in town in 1957, primarily, again, because there was this shift in population coming. Uh, well, there, <laughs> there was a shift of population and then it dropped, mm -hmm. and there were so few people, especially out uh, in Pian Township, you know, going south. And the people that were left were right here in town. Okay, yeah. So, and that was primarily because the fishing just dropped. Well, the fishing, j again, just collapsed. Mm -hmm. it, it, and, you know, it's remarkable because of the eel, it collapsed almost overnight. Right. Because it didn't take long for the eel to decimate the Upper Great Lakes fishing, in terms of the whitefish particularly. And the whitefish was a very commercially uh, sought-after fish and brought in good money. And a lot of that was exported to Detroit, uh, Lower Lower Michigan, Chicago, you know, all over the place, Milwaukee, etc. So a lot of it was. Uh, was you know <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Now can we stop for a moment? Oh, I'll use the bathroom. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Put her on hold. Right, so we could backtrack a little bit. Um, okay. And I wanted to ask, sort of, in light of the booming fishing industry, sort of late 1800s, you know, turn of century, mm -hmm. um, I was sort of curious about whether um, any sort of any sort of class distinction or class division occurred when the fishing families sort of did they gain any extra? Interesting question. Uh, 
in all communities, there is a natural social pecking order. There's no doubt about that. <coughs> For example, the, the men who were able to build boats and then sell them to the fishermen were in a class by themselves <coughs> because they could build the boat and then sell it for money. They ennobled en themselves, so to speak, and one of the really great uh, boat builders was James McCann, and he accumulated a good amount of money and built a very nice home, as did several other tradespeople. <coughs> so there was a little bit of that, not very much, because pretty much everybody was on the same socioeconomic level. Now, when you owned a saloon or a store, you also were able to accumulate more cash. Now, that didn't mean you got rich. My great-grandfather, who had the store down in Sand Bay, certainly did not become wealthy. <coughs> There's no, you know, etc. There was just a way of maintaining a basic living with that. The fishermen themselves, which were, who were many of them, were in the same kind of almost a little bit below, but they also were able to accumulate some cash, as were the farmers who sold cows or pigs. You could bring in some kind of cash, but very little. The basic was a sustenance level. The fish, you now you've got to remember, <coughs> you'd go out and spend hours pulling in nets, pulling in fish, put them in boxes, and you were getting eight, ten cents a pound. Okay, so that was very, very little in terms of that, uh, all through the latter part of the 19th into the 20th century. By the 1920s, uh, from what my father used to tell us. I remember asking him how things were, uh, this is a rather famous quote that I think a lot of people that grew up here in those days would have said the same thing. In a sense, there was no depression here because everybody was at the same poor level. Everybody was equal. Uh, everyone was poor. So there wasn't this noticeable change in terms of where you had urban situations, Detroit, the big cities, Grand Rapids, and so on you did feel the effects of the depression, but not up here, because everybody was poor. There was really, you know, really no wealthy people. And no one ever really got wealthy. I mean, you had a few families that were li able to build better homes. Um, and there was a certain, and I think Dr. Rotman in her investigation of Irish communities, you then would end up with a few people, and this gradually occurred in the latter part of the 19th into the early 20th, lace curtain Irish, in which you accumulated some cash so that you were able to decorate your home in a very nice way. And, and the reason is, the first thing you did was to buy curtains <laughs> for the house. And my father, at one point, must have been a summer or something, worked in one of the lumber camps down on the west side. And he hated it, and he said it was extremely hard work. And our display here in the museum shows how difficult it was and how little they were paid. <coughs> and he had a, a, a thing about windows being covered with curtains. You had to have curtains covering the window, because in those lumber camps there was nothing. I mean, they, you were lucky you had a window, let alone covered. So he had this thing about that. But I would say there was a certain amount of social but nothing very, uh, very wide. Everyone was really pretty much in the same boat. So obviously, some, you know, some some were smarter than others. Um, some, you know, could pick up and, and and make a buck quicker than somebody else. There were quite a few saloons here all through the, you know, latter part of the 19th century into the 20th. Um, Whiskey Point obviously is named because they would sell whiskey there, and that goes back to the 1850s, and uh, Whiskey Island. Uh, there was a lot of bootlegging in the Upper Great Lakes in the 1930s during Prohibition. 
a lot of it was homemade and a lot of it was brought in from Canada by boat very easily and taken down to the major cities uh, Chicago, Milwaukee being the two big ones and downstate and, and Michigan and so on. So there was a lot of bootlegging and a lot of people made money you know, uh, through the 30s with uh, selling, selling with me. Do you know if your family... No, no, we didn't. Uh, we didn't. By then, there were no boats. Okay. My great, my grandfather Malloy had the meat market, and then his son, and Grandpa was fishing or at the lumber mill, and then when the fishing gave out in the 40s, we had no boats. So, but there were others that uh, you know would come in, and uh, so there was quite a bit of that. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess, could we switch gears to sort of the history of religion sure, on the island? Sure, sure. Yeah, I, th I think we've covered the family and, and, and certainly the, the times, uh, the insights I have okay. that I got from my grandparents and my father and, and, and so on. Um, I, I think recapping, it was wonderful for kids to grow up here. But after 18, there was no work. You had to go to school off island. Many of my cousins, especially the girls, then went to college, as as our generation did, the first generation that went to college. Okay. Met their husbands, raised families, and then decided to come back for after retirement. Right. So so right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now let's go over to uh, what? Do you want a general question or? Um, should we just go back to what now? What specific questions about the church? Specifically, um, I, I actually, I don't really have any. Specific? I have some, but maybe if you started with sort of the general history of like. Right. Give me if a specific know question. You well, actually, I was wondering if you knew anything about like Father Gallagher and his yeah, influence yes. on the island. Yes. I've made a point of, of studying and reading everything that's been written about him. Okay. Uh, Paul Connor's thesis, of course, has a great deal of information about him. The church, the Catholic Church on Beaver Island, now we have to go back to the French trappers and traders. And this whole upper Great Lakes was settled and was well known to French trappers out of Quebec and Montreal in the 1620s. Okay. 1620s to 1640s, you had a great deal of exploration by the French trappers and the missionaries, primarily the Jesuits and another group called the Recollects, two religious communities. And they would accompany the trappers in racing around in canoes all over the upper Great Lakes looking for beaver. And uh, the missionaries, of course, wanted to establish missions among the Indians many different uh, Native American groups and uh, accompanied also the trappers and um, so that went on for a long time. In 1832 Father Baraga who later became the first bishop of Marquette was sent up to this part of Michigan and started establishing missions. He landed here in 1832, and there was just a few Indian families on the island and a few other traders. This was pre-Mormon. And then he established a, a site at uh, Cross Village there. You know, there was a larger group of Indian people, the, the um, Ojibwe uh, and the Ottawa uh, were there. And then in 1860, he had become the Bishop of Marquette and he established the parish, Holy Cross Parish, in 1860. And then he commissioned a, a builder to build the church, 1860 to 61, and they built it for about $250. <coughs> and the, most of the present structure, the midsection of the present structure is that original building built in 1860. In 1900, 1905, they added on a little bit of the front and extended the back some more. And the first priest, Catholic priest, was Father Murray, who was here from 1861 to 1866. Now, the thing about Father Murray is he could not speak Gaelic. 
And as we talked about the early families coming over, my own and many others, they only spoke Gaelic. So he had a difficult time those six years, five years. And he and the bishop were good friends and they corresponded by letter and so on. It took about five months to get a letter from here to Sault Ste. Marie and then back, about five months. So finally, uh, he decided, and the bishop decided, that um, he, he would go over to Alpina, Father Murray. And then the bishop had to figure out who to bring to Beaver Island. So he had just ordained a, an Irishman from County Tyrone by the name of Peter Gallagher. Now, Peter Gallagher was not related to anyone on Beaver Island, and there were five or so, four, four or five Gallagher families, independent of each other, not related, but they all shared the same name. He and his siblings and family came from County Tyrone and landed in Philadelphia. And around 1864, uh, as it was customary, he was out this way and he became a uh, priest, uh, Bishop uh, Barriga, uh, now Bishop Barriga, uh, ordained him and decided to send him here because he spoke perfect Gaelic. He was fluent in Gaelic and given the Irish temperament for speaking and uh, storytelling, he was very, very good, very good. And he was the pastor from 1866 to his death in 1898, 32 years. Now, he actually played a very important role, not only in the development, in the continuation of the um, Catholic religion, um, there's some criticism of him as a priest. He had <laughs> had some very interesting. For example, he was a crack shot. He could shoot a, a bird off a tree at 300 paces or whatever, and he was really just a <laughs> crack shot. He was also a boxer, and he got into several fights. But he was a very good boxer, and of course he had some money. Not only as the pastor, he used to get about 200. And $95 a year as his stipend for being the pastor of the parish. But he also had money from his family. His family became quite well-to-do out in Philadelphia, particularly a brother who became a very large liquor distributor. And so he had money from his family, and uh, his brother would also send him whiskey. Uh, which Father Gallagher did not give away free. He would charge for it, obviously. So he would loan money to farmers who needed money for seed or to buy some cows, etc. And he brought, I think, the first uh, pair of oxen to the island, Father Peter Gallagher did. So he was instrumental in helping people get going in terms of farming. Now, he charged 6 or 7% six or interest, and he made sure he got the money back. And he himself acquired quite a bit of land. We don't really know where his land holdings were. We'd have to, if we could, we'd go back to the tax records way back. And, and he had some animals and so on, and he acquired them. Uh, the rectory, he used to live, it was a uh, sort of a rundown house kind of behind uh, kind of where the call house is or Willie John's house is, just kind of around the corner from here and up up above, which later was, you know, t torn down um, in terms of the house. But he lived there for many, many years. Whether he had his own house somewhere does not seem to be recorded. He used the rectory as his place of living. And uh, then, of course, the church was up in the country at the, where the, we call the Four Corners there, King's Highway there. And, um, and of course, you just went up in a horse and buggy or a horse, whatever your you know, uh, mode was. But he also was able to be kind of a political leader also. He had some education. He could read and write, which a lot of them could not. So you always look to the leader. And in Catholic 
in Ireland, the Irish, in terms of Catholicism, being Catholic, would look to their parish priest as a potential leader. And he obviously had a personality that took on leadership qualities. Um, and he you know, sort of became a quasi-political boss also, and was able to settle disputes, uh, bring people together, you know, and get some kind of a compromise if there was a really difficult situation. And in a way, uh, was able to kind of direct and help direct the community. Uh, you had, as far as civil government, um, all through the 19th century, up until 1895, <coughs> these islands were one county. The Manitous, the Foxes, and the Beaver were Manitou County, our own county, and we had three townships on Beaver Island. That changed in 1895, <coughs> when it was reduced to two townships, and then the islands were given to Charlevoix County, and the Manitous and the Fox Islands were given to um, Lelemark County. So he acted as a quasi-political leader through that whole 32-year period, and um, you know, during that whole time, it was a growth economy. Uh, people did very well. The, the population the census figures show upwards of 900 people lived here year-round, uh, which was a very large group of people. And um, so it went on quite, you know, quite well. Uh, there are a lot of funny stories about him, particularly with the, the two b different bishops. Um, one down in Grand Rapids. And the Catholic Diocese, uh, we kept being shifted from Marquette. Um, first we were in Detroit, which took up the whole state of Michigan. Then when Father Berger was made Bishop of Marquette, <coughs> he also took on Beaver Island. And then later out of Detroit, uh, Grand Rapids was made a diocese, and then we were attached to Grand Rapids. And that lasted until 1970. But um, there are a lot of stories about him, and um, I think the bottom line was that he certainly was able to help the island in terms of his abilities. So. Great. Yeah. Um, well, I know Caroline's interested specifically in the uh, Irish Catholicism. Do you want to ask? No. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm just interested for my project, um, sort of given this influx of specifically Irish immigrants mm -hmm. to the island, and as you said, there wasn't a whole lot of integration before the 1900s, especially in terms of language. Um, so I'm kind of interested in whether you know whether sort of specifically Irish Catholic traditions followed to Beaver Island, um, including, you know, even veneration of um, Irish saints and what kind of traditions surrounded that, if any. Um, yes and no. We have to go back to the period of the famine, which devastated, particularly western, the western mm -hmm. part of Ireland. Um, the statistics show that upwards of a million people in that three or four, three year period died from starvation. Mm -hmm. Another million, if not more, fled and spread throughout the world. During that time, there was a there was a modest amount of devotional situations that the Irish Catholics would have been following, but n but not the way we think of them in the 20th century. Um, the rosary probably was not as widespread, and the fact that uh, devotional to saints was there because there was a great oral tradition and uh, particularly St. Bridget, St. Patrick and quite a number of others in terms of that but in terms of the state of the church during that famine period and after it was very difficult very difficult so I would say that when they came here there was a little bit there but then gradually through the decades that increased as you became more settled, and as the economy, the fishing economy and the farming economy, allowed people to have a more settled communal life, which it was, it was very settled. Uh, in the winter, <laughs> I mean, you had 
go across with a sled and a horse if you could manage. So the island became very, very communal in that sense, and then you had a stronger Irish Catholicism developing. Father Peter Gallagher was able to help this along a little bit. He was not what you would call a proficient um, proponent of that. The priest that followed him, Father Zugelder, in 1900, 1899-1900, he was here for about six years, he was of German origin and brought in a number of German Catholic families to the island, of which their ancestors are, their descendants are still here. Riskers being one of them, <coughs> Schmidt, another, and so on. He was the one in that early 1900s that was able to develop uh, what we call devotional Catholicism among the Irish. So it took about 40 years or so or a generation and a half for them to really get into uh, that. Now, that carried well into the first half of the 20th century. When we were kids, everybody was Catholic. There were a few, and I can't even remember, um, there were a few Protestant. Larsons, I think, were one, and these would have been Swedish or Norwegian descendants and so on. and uh, But for the most part, it was all Catholic. And for the most part, people went to church all through the 20th century on a regular basis, received the sacraments, baptism, First Communion, and so on. Uh, there was devotional, uh, the rosary being a very well-developed one in the first half of the 20th century, as it developed in other Irish communities and Irish parishes in the big cities. Mm -hmm. um, novenas, to some extent, not as much as you would have in a big parish, but to a limited extent here. And the rosary was usually conducted in homes mm -hmm. where the family or friends would gather um, certainly at least once a week, if not more frequently. And um, I certainly can remember that as a child in the 50s here where it would be in di different people's homes and we would take 15 or 20 minutes to um, um, say the rosary in the evening usually. And that developed all through the 20th century and that became stronger and stronger. The Christian Brothers arrived here in 1929, uh, the Brothers Place, which we call, and it was a retreat center for the Brothers, the Christian Brothers, primarily out of the Midwest. and. Um, that went on from 1929 through, I think, well into the 70s. And then, uh, for various reasons, they stopped coming, and um, then later the, uh, the place was sold. But there again, you had a very strong identity with Catholicism because of them. And uh, all through the 20th century, you had priests that lived here mm -hmm. year-round, took care of the parish, were here every day of the week and developed various uh, devotional things. The Franciscans, it alternated between the diocesan clergy of Grand Rapids and the Franciscan community out of uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And from the 40s on, we had uh, Franciscans, and then uh, that developed or lasted until the 19. 80s or so, and then we had diocesan, and before that we had diocesan, so it alternated between that. Okay, so that, yeah, so that's a good, um, the island, the, the Catholicism in the 20th century developed in major urban areas mm -hmm. very well. Um, and having lived in, for example, South Bend for three years, 50 to 53. We belong to a very nice parish, a beautiful parish, St. Monica, Catholic school, grammar school. I went to Catholic high school, as my brother did. And um, you had the same devotional situation here on the island. Okay. It was very funny. We had a, a very nice, and, and as in Irish communities, even today, you still have, you had uh, little statues of the Blessed Mother in little grottos in the yard and so on and so forth. And we had a, a, a little grotto devoted to um, now St. Martin de Porres. And he was a blessed in those days. And I cannot remember why we had a particular devotion to 
Martin de Porres. He was a Dominican lay brother in the 16th century in Peru. He was a mulatto, and he was well known for his work among the poor. But where we got the Dominican influence was probably through the sisters who were Dominican out of Grand Rapids. And I suspect that that was where the influence came. Uh, he was obviously a, a, a Dominican saint, a blessed, and he later became a saint. And But we had this little grotto out in the woods in town here. It was very pretty. And we'd go out there and say a little prayer, and then we'd go on our way. So uh, that was, uh, I always remember that. So any other okay. questions? Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's great. Okay, so so essentially you would say that a lot of the um, folk traditions that maybe would have been more pre-famine era, um, you know, things like St. Bridget's Day celebrations, that sort of thing, those wouldn't necessarily have translated here. They would have been kind of left back. In they would have been left behind primarily because of this shattering of, of, of the culture because of the famine. famine. Okay. And then it took a while... I think, and I, I think that Dr. Radman, in terms of her research, uh, you know, for example, uh, having been doing my priesthood in, the, in Connecticut for 20 plus years, large Irish communities in Boston, New York, Philadelphia, it took half a century for them to really, you know, and the Irish Catholic Church in the United States, the, the Catholic Church in the United States is primarily Irish. Most of the bishops were Irish. Most of the priests were Irish. The other large group of Catholics in the United States were the Germans, German Catholics. And, and then you had German bishops. And the builders of the Catholic Church were from the 20s on, after World War I. I mean, that's when you had this boom, not only in the economy, vis-a-vis -vis the... Uh, obviously the Depression, and into World War II, but you had this tremendous boom through immigration of various nationalities in the Catholic Church. The Irish were the ones who led the boom from the latter 19th century into the 20th. And by 1960, the Catholic Church was at its, as they say, its pinnacle. We had all the statistics will peak in 1960. The largest number of priests, nuns, brothers, the largest number of parishes, the largest number of children in parochial school systems. I think it was something like three and a half million across the country. We had the, you know, the second largest educational system. We had hospitals. We had uh, you know, just unbelievable social uh, situations, uh, especially in the big urban areas. You know, um, Francis Cabrini in Chicago and other places, you know, where they all were developed by, by that. So the Irish devotional thing really reasserted itself very strongly in the latter part of the 19th into the 20th century. Okay. And now, of course, we've had another wave on the downside of, of, of lacking that kind of uh, devotional uh, situation. So. Okay. Any other questions? Um, actually, uh, yeah, um, last year one of the students was doing a research project about um, sort of marriages on the island, and she was looking at, um, or she was wondering, one of the questions she didn't get answered was like what the Catholic Church here's position would have been about people marrying non-Catholics on the island, particularly during like the second generation Irish? Or All right. Uh, yeah, there wouldn't have been much of that because there were no non-Irish. Okay. Uh, there were a few French families okay. um, which would have intermarried. My cousins, the Lafayette family, they, uh, of course, were French and they came from Oh, just above Big Rapids, they came to the island in the late 1890s or turn of the century. And then, of course, before the Mormon time, there were uh, French traders. On the island during the 19th into the 20th century, Catholics married Catholics. 
um, <laughs> and uh, were duly recorded uh, in terms of the marriage book. The genealogy history of the island is very well maintained because of the documentation in the baptismal and marriage books kept by the Holy Cross Church, which go back to 1860. Mm -hmm. So you had a very, very, very good record of families in terms of their marriage, baptism, and death. So basically, I would say up until after World War II, in Catholic circles, um, Catholics mm -hmm. married Catholics. Okay. So now, one of the interesting comments about marriage up here, and I've, I've referred to this in, in several talks I've given, going back to the 19th century under Father Peter Gallagher. In Irish communities here, in the Irish community here, as in other places, you had this age difference in the man and the woman. Generally, Irish men married later, depending on the number of women in a community. Now, in my family, Hugh Conahan, that of the, one of the three, his his wife was married three times. And I'll go back to what happened. She married a fellow by the name of Raymond McDonald and had two children. He died, I believe, on the water, drowning or ship uh, boat fell in or whatever it was. So she was left with two children. Now, what they did on the island, and primarily through Father Peter Gallagher and his so-called bachelor club, they would sit down and they would figure out what available men were there that could marry this widow with her children and provide support for them. So they picked my great-grandfather, Hugh Conahan, who was in his 40s, and she was in her 20s, and they proceeded to have another six children, six more children. Then he died at the age of, of 64 in 1894 of a heart attack. Now she's a widow now a second time with eight children, of which the youngest was about five or six years old, Mabel. Mabel Cull, who later lived next door here. So for the second, third time, for the second time, Father Gallagher got them together and said, now what are we going to do with the widow Bridget, who's got eight kids now, because Hugh Conahan just died. So they went to, they found Larry McDonough, who was a bachelor, much older. He married her. They, they were beyond, uh, or she was beyond uh, child producing. And they raised the eight children, particularly the last six, because they were the youngest ones, and then she died at McDonough. So she was married three times. Now that's how marriage, in terms of the community, was looked after with a widow with children. Because in her position, she was unable to take care of not only the children, but herself. So she had to have a situation in which some man so it was kind of a communal, community decision-making process. Who was available? Who had the means to take care of them? Because Hugh Conahan had a store. So he could take on a widow with two kids. And then he proceeded to have six more. <laughs> so that's a very interesting footnote in terms of marriage in a very small community like this. Now whether that happened in other Irish communities, I think would be an interesting point in Dr. Rodman's, uh, Rodman's uh, uh, classes and, and so on in terms of further research. Yeah. How was that handled in small cities like South Bend? Right. You know, among the Irish community. How was that handled? Okay. Um, that's, so that's, a, that's an interesting point. Uh, now, anything else on marriage? You had marriage, yeah. What, nothing else? You know, in general, uh, as I say, the Irish re-establish Catholicism in the United States to a very large degree. And then you had waves of other immigration. Then came the Germans, which was very in the upper Midwest, a very large number of German Catholics. After Bismarck, um, uh, Bismarck, uh, in terms of Prussia, was uh, somewhat anti-Catholic. 
Then you had waves in the latter part of the 19th century of Italians, 1890 to 1920, large numbers of Italians. Uh, the economy in Italy in the latter part of the 19th century going into World War I and then after. Then you had other, other groups. Then you had Central Europeans, Polish, uh, Slovaks, Czechs, uh, that, that, that period. And then, of course, all through the latter part of the 19th and for the early 20th, you had large Jewish uh, immigration coming into the United States from all over Europe, different parts of, of, of Europe. Um, so that was a continuum in terms of... And then today, of course, uh, the census showed that the l largest... In some states, the Caucasian population is the minority. African American, Hispanic, and, and Asian. <coughs> So, you know, what goes around comes around, or what comes around goes around. So again, you have this continuum in the United States in, our, in terms of our, uh, and that's the only way to move an economy. You, you, you know, in, in today's world, in Western Europe and in Japan, Japan being the worst, um, there's, no, there's no young people coming in. I thought you can't have an economy without young people. And that's going to be a major problem over the next 10 to 15 years, including the United States. So, does that answer? Yeah? yeah. Good? Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Anything uh, else? Could I ask you a random, well, not random, random. but yeah. sort of bonus question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was wondering, <laughs> you know, we're excavating over at the Doni Gallagher yeah. house. Yeah. Um, do you know anything about that house? I don't know really anything about that house. Okay. Uh, Bill Cashman would, would know a lot more of the history of that. Um, you know, those were typical farm areas along that road, and then Pajanog Road was another farm area, and of course Darkey Town Road, where we had the farm, all the way out to Barney's Lake was another area of farms. And those were all farmhouses in, in various ways and um, and there are things to be found because even at our old farmhouse my Uncle Danny used to they would throw the cans and pottery and crockery if something broke they just take it out in the back of the house and throw it into a pile mm -hmm. so you do have things that would have been buried uh, through the years various you know kinds so but no I don't really know much about uh, check with Bill you know, okay, check with Bill <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, it may be a pre-Mormon or it may be a a, a Mormon house. Right, yeah. See, and it's instilling good condition. The amazing thing about these log houses, if they're encapsulated in siding of some sort, they're they're preserved. That's right. Yeah. I mean, those logs do not rot. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really is. And when I think of our, when I go and look at our own farmhouse. In the late 50s, we put a, 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 an asbestos siding, which was common, mm -hmm. it was in squares, kind of a gray thing. And that's still on, and the owner re redid the roof, but the siding is still on. Oh, wow. Yeah. So those houses stay, you know, a long time. Mm -hmm. So, Any other bonus questions? Uh, <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> really cool. Do you know anything about the Mormons who lived on the island? Well, the, the, the we have three, you know, three very well researched and, and written books on the Mormon history okay. of roughly 1840, 48, 49 to uh, 1856. The King Strang Mormons were an offshoot. When Brigham Young, when when Smith was killed in Novo, 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 Novo Illinois in 1848. 47, 48. The Mormons were all along there and ready to move west. And then Brigham Young said, okay, I'm the new leader. Whereas Strang said, no, I'm the new leader. And he supposedly had a letter, which later was proved to be forgery, forged, claiming that he was Smith's heir. So Brigham Young took the main group and moved west. Utah, and history, of course, followed them. 
Strang had this small group and went up to a uh, little corner of southeast Wisconsin near just to the west of Racine and established a community there. In 1847 or 48, he found out about the island, came up here to investigate. Thought, okay, this is, you know, there are a few Native American uh, families uh, between here, Garden Island, High Island, mostly between here and Garden Island, and a few traders, and then there was a settlement over on Whiskey Point, of course, where there were some traders. <coughs> and um, so he, you know, moved in around 1849 with a large contingent, and by 1850-51, he, you know, had most of his followers up here, and they cleared fields, and built King's Highway, and you know, established a real community. And it was a short-lived community. He got himself elected to the state legislature in 1852 or 54. I forget which of the elections there. And then people got kind of uh, uh, nervous down in Lansing about this fellow up here in northern Michigan. Because there were very few settlers in this whole area. And of course he had this large contingent of Mormons up here. So the other thing about the Mormons, of course, is that you had to tithe to the church and to him, which was 10% of your property every year. And that meant monies, foods, cattle, you know, et cetera. So 10% of your produce, 10% of your wealth, not just once in your lifetime, but every year had to go to the ch Mormon church uh, using the old tithing uh, you know, situation. So. He became also a polygamist, which he did not start out to be. He really rejected polygamy, but then he acquired uh, four additional wives uh, other than his first one. And then in 1856, some of his followers were really kind of tired of him, and two of his followers decided to assassinate him, which they did, and he died about six weeks later in July of 1856, and that ended the community. So when, like, the Irish came back to the island, is it possible that Mormon families still stuck around, or...? Very few. Okay. Very few. I mean, they were, uh, they were exiled. Okay. Uh, they were, they were, they were pushed off the island. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they didn't have much of a choice. One of the things to remember, that when you have a cult-like situation, which Strang was, and the leader is no longer there, or gone, or assassinated in this case, you're leaderless. You're leaderless. <laughs> oh, they're feeding the seagulls. They're feeding the seagulls. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of them left out of fear. And then, of course, the Irish came back from across the mainland and just, you know, really pushed them off and took over their farms. And, you know, some of the historical s stories that some of the hearts were still warm mm -hmm. and the Irish settlers I don't think it was quite that way but <laughs> but there was certainly a large number of people which meant that there would have been a large number of farms and houses and so on and so forth. Now when the Mormons left they took as much as they could but I'm sure some of them they certainly left their tools and their farm implements and their furniture and you know things like that. But they were they were Exile. Yeah. And then the Irish came in and just kept, you know, going. So crazy birds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they um, and then the Irish, of course, then took over. The, 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 the Native American people, when the Irish and the, some of the traders started fighting with the Mormons when they first got here. They just quietly moved over to Garden Island, okay. the Native American people. And then when they came back, or when Strang was gone, they, they started coming back. Uh, and then many of them lived over in High Island, too, much larger community. So there was a fairly good-sized community up until the 60s and 70s, when again, because of economics, they moved away. The three families here now are the same three families of many, many, many generations, probably going back 300 years. Wow. Yeah. Still here. That's yeah. Amazing. So it's, um, 
or any other? I think you covered it all. Yeah, You've okay. been <laughs> unbelievably <laughs> helpful. Thank good. you so much. Well, very good. Okay. Gosh, been great. All right, and we'll end that.